If you're just joining us, welcome. Otherwise, you know we've been in a series on the book of Judges. And today, Palm Sunday, we have arrived. We have now reached the end of the book of Judges. I don't know whether to be excited or relieved. <laughs> a little bit of both. I mean, uh, if you were here from the very beginning, you remember I told you, not my word, but a perfect word from a commentator. He called judges, you know, this downward spiral where God's people just go further and further away from the Lord to the point where God's people don't look any different than their pagan neighbors. They worship all these other gods. He called it, the book of Judges, he called it the Canaanization of Israel. Here they are in Canaan, in the promised land, and, 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 and instead of being in the world, like the boat floating on the water, yeah, that's no problem. All the water has gotten into the boat, and now things are, are sinking, right? The Canaanization of Israel, now we come to the end of Judges, and Canaanization is complete. I mean, God's people have drifted so far that the last chapters of Judges don't read anything like the first 16 chapters. They're so different. These final chapters of Judges, like, what do you do with them? I mean, you, there's no mention of God, uh, hardly, no, no mention of a judge being raised up. It's hard to know what to do with them. The, the, these stories are so different. We don't have these deliverers. We don't have any of that. They're just sort of these boring, petty stories and gruesome. I mean, have, have you ever heard anyone so stupid as to try to preach on these texts? I mean, until now, yeah. this guy, yeah. Why not? Because everything so far has been, in, I mean, okay, it, it's been a downward spiral, but at least it's been a wild ride. I mean, 16 chapters, you get these 12 judges, you get, um, you know, God's people get in trouble, they, 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 they forget God, God raises up a nation to subjugate them, they cry out, and then what? He raises a deliverer, you get Deborah and Gideon and Samson, it's thrilling and exciting to see God's salvation. And now you, you turn here. I mean, think about how far we've fallen. Used to be the whole nation would rise up. Then at least certain tribes would rise up, you know, and the others would be looked down upon for not fighting in the good fight. And then when you get to Gideon, at least like 300 get raised up. And by the time you get to Samson, it's like one, you know, Samson. But now, nobody. Nobody. I mean, they, they, they don't seem to be about anything. It's, it's sort of these, chapter 17 starts with these sort of boring, petty people doing sort of boring, petty things. And then out of nowhere, that's why the reader is unprepared for Judges 19, which is one of the darkest, most gruesome, gory, uh, sickening, twisted acts of monstrous wickedness in the entire Bible. It like comes out of nowhere, I'm, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Here we go. Judges 17. Let's just start in Judges 17th chapter. Now, I'll show you what I mean. It starts out with this random Israelite, Micah. We meet in verse 1. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now, apparently, uh, Micah has a mom who's been robbed. Yeah. Somebody stole 1,100 pieces of silver from Micah's mama, and mom utters a curse on whoever that thief was. And Micah hears it, he thinks, uh-oh, because it was him. <laughs> he's, the one who, he's the one who stole the money, and he believes in God just enough to be scared of the curse that's been called down. So he goes to mom and basically like, uh, <laughs> moms, uh, listen, I, uh, it, you know, it was me, my bad. And if you could revoke that curse, look at what he says in verse 2. He said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that <clears throat> were um, <clears throat> taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, which is a, a, a sort of stilted way of saying, I overheard the nasty things that were going to happen to the person that took this stuff. And, well, behold, the silver's with me. Well, how'd you get? Because I took it. <laughs> I'm it. I'm the thief. You know, here's the money. Please take back the curse. And the woman, the mom, is so grateful that the son has confessed that it, she blessed, she turns the curse into a blessing. And his mother said, blessed by, be my son by the Lord. So just, just lousy parenting, really, all, all, all the way around. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. You notice he extorts the mom. You reverse the curse and then I'll give you your money back. 
Like, where do we start with this train wreck of a family? Okay, we're getting ahead of myself. So she goes on. She gets so excited. She thinks, you know what? You rest- my son restored the money. What a miracle. You know, that my kid is a total delinquent, by the way. And he restored this money. So now I'm going to say thank you to God for giving me such an honest son. Again, irony noted, the honest son is the one who took it. Uh, and here's how I'm going to thank God. I'm going to thank God by making some idols of him because he'll love that. So verse 3, his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Just curious before we, well, it's already up there, but does anybody remember? It'll be fun if you read this verse and you remember. Does anybody remember how much uh, silver was restored to her? Do you remember? Uh, Do you remember the number? Just call it out there. It was what? That's right, 1,100. Yeah. Yeah. So when he restored the money to his, and and she dedicates all that to the Lord. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200, yes, 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. There's so much wrong with this, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, she dedicates all 1,100 pieces to the Lord, and then she cheats. The silversmith only gives 200 when it comes time. She doesn't care about her vows. On top of that, she's directly violating the second commandment. Everybody remember the Ten Commandments? Number one, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of bondage, right? I brought you out of Egypt, okay? No other gods before me. Number two, don't make an image to represent me. Like all these other pagan gods, you got a little statue of Dagon for the Philistine gods, you got a little statue of Baal and Mrs. Baal, Asheroth, and that's and they're, and they're very large and they represent the fertility gods. Eh. No graven image. Don't make wood and carve it. Don't make metal and fabricate it. Don't, don't do that. Okay, that, that's the second commandment. So mother and son, here we have in the first four verses, mother and son just just committing apostasy together, okay? And they're just sort of designing their own religion. And when you start there, why stop? Verse 5, and the man Micah had a shrine. Now he's got these household gods set up. And he made an ephod and household gods. An ephod is like the garment the priest would wear to, uh, you could use it to determine God's will. Sort of a a kind of homemade, sort of in his case, kind of a magic eight ball. You know, if we we can, this ephod will determine uh, what the will of God is on any decision. And he, why not? He ordained one of his sons who became his priest. This is a perversion of the true sanctuary where worship was to take place at Shiloh. The ephod and the household gods were later condemned as flat-out idolatry. Micah further violates the Mosaic law. He, he takes a pre, his own son and he makes him his private priest, which, I mean, A, uh, a priest were not for private service. They're for public service to the community of Israel. And B, the priest is supposed to come, if you read God's law, it's supposed to come from the sons of Aaron, descendants of Aaron of the tribe of Levi. The guy's not even a Levite. He's not even a proper priest, and he just sort of ordains him himself. You think, how did we get there? Well, of course, it's simple to know how you got there. Look at verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. A decent king would have put a stop to all these shenanigans. And there was no king in Israel. And then have you heard this before? Everyone, this is the theme, isn't it? Everyone did what? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We're making it up as we go along. You want a religion that suits you? Make a religion that suits you. Make a version of God that works for you. And this works for Micah. Every week, Micah got something out of it. You know, it was was, was very me-centered. What happens next? We meet another random character. Verse 7. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. Hey. And he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, y'all not going to believe this, he came, what, wouldn't you know, he came, to the, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? He said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem and Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I find a place. And Micah said to him, well, hot dog, a genuine Levite. I can't believe my good fortune. See, I knew God was providential. I knew he was smiling on me. I got myself a genuine Levite. Stay with me and be to me a father and priest. The son's like, hey, what about me? We're done. All right? No more. I got myself a genuine Levite priest. 
And the Levite's going, uh, that's not really how this works. You're not supposed to do that. You don't just self-ordain a priest. He says, I'll give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and you're living. The Levite's like, well, let me pray about it. Okay, yes. <laughs> Total sellout. And the Levite went in. Well, verse 11, the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. Verse 12, and Micah ordained the Levite, because at this point, we're all just making stuff up. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. And then, verse 13, we reach the ultimate goal of self-made religion. Then Micah said, ah, the ultimate goal. Now I know that the Lord will prosper me. Why? He has to. Because I have a Levite as priest. There you go. That's chapter 17. I mean, it, 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 like what did I tell you? It's sort of boring, spineless people doing sort of boring, sinful, petty things. And then what happens in chapter 18 is more of the same. If you'll just allow me to summarize chapter 18, in the next chapter, the chapter 18, another group of Israelites show up at Micah's house. They're from the tribe of Dan. They're called the Danites. And watch this. They have more money than Micah. And so they go to, they go to that Levite and they say, hey, what are you doing here? We can pay you, uh, you know, you, you should come with us. We're, we're from the tribe of Dan. You should come with us. And the priest says, no way, I'm not coming with you. And they said, well, we'll pay you much more. And he's like, you know what? I'm suddenly feeling called. <laughs> Sellouts. And so they go. And they're like, oh, hey, priest, why are you going? Make sure you bring the household gods. What's a priest without gods, right? So they gathered up the household gods. And Micah can't figure out what's going on here. And so he, well, he comes running out. Hey, he says, you can't, take my, you can't take my priest and my statues. And they say, what's the big deal? Why you get bent out of shape? Skip to 18, verse 24. And Micah said, if you take my gods that I made, what have I left? And they basically say, go home or we might hurt you. And so he did. And that's how the story ends. <laughs> I mean, that's it. It's so random. It, if this story had a title, it would be Micah, Mom, and the Levite. Like, there's, there's nothing here. It's just, he says, boring people doing boring things. Yeah, they're sinful, they're petty, you know, but okay, so she has some idolatry or whatever. And then, watch this, and then the reader is, understandably, utterly caught off guard by what happens next. Chapter 19 is an act of monstrous wickedness, darkest, gruesome chapters in the entire, one of the darkest, most gruesome, uh, twisted chapters in the whole Bible. A, Le a different Levite marries an unfaithful concubine. They travel to this town. They're not given any hospitality. Finally, somebody offers them a home, and things are worse in this town than it ever was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And this unfaithful concubine was left outside, given over to sinful men. They brutally rape her and murder her 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 body then is torn into 12 pieces and each piece given delivered to a tribe of Israel which leads to an entire genocide destruction of entire race right down to the infants towns leveled which then leads all of the children of Israel to civil war oh Israel won't unite to fight for God anymore the only time you can get God's people united is when they fight each other then they team up it's leaving scorched earth it's hell on earth and you go where did this come from and, and the writer of Judges is just, just, just laying it out there, matter-of-factly. No comment, not saying this is good, not saying this is clearly wicked. Just th this is, and then it hits you. My question, the framework behind this whole message is, of all the stories that could lead to that level of wickedness, why Micah, Mom, and the Levite? Like, how do you get from Micah, Mom, and the Levite to this disturbing, dark, genocide, civil war, rape and murder and then it hits you every other part and I, I want to give credit to Tim Keller who's the he's the first one to point this out in, in, in a book I read about about judges from him he pointed this out every other part of the book of judges so far has been about God's salvation these chapters show us the nature of sin these chapters show us this is life without God and the author's just writing it through there and it shows us some things about sin that are surprising. See, some people have stereotypes about sin, that the Bible teaches about sin and evil. And, you know, a lot of people would say, well, to err is human. And, and you know, we, we, we sort of, we get that. People mess up. But at the, at the worst stages of sin, right, follow me, at the, at the downward spiral, at the very bottom of the stages of wickedness, we picture what? 
these sort of supervillains, right? They're very creative, like James Bond supervillains, right? And they've got sharks with lasers, and they're always very creative, and all these, and they're, they're going to have these weapons of mass destruction and all this. The book of Judges shows us something utterly different. It turns out that when people think, oh yeah, as, they, as you sin more and more, you get more and more creative. It's actually the opposite. Sin ultimately makes you not just bad, but boring. Less creative, less fresh. There is no... Um, so political theorist Hannah Arendt, uh, she uh, coined this phrase, nailed it. Uh, so she was a Jew who fled Germany years ago before uh, Hitler's rise to power. She traveled back after she was a reporter. She covered the trial for the Nazi war criminals, particularly of Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the Holocaust, right? So he's, I mean the chief over all the, 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 the wickedness of the concentration camps and the whole thing, the Holocaust. And what she expected, so she, it was originally an article for the New Yorker, but what she expected was this sinister sociopath, and she was shocked, and coined this phrase, by how there was no real trace of any Semitic personality that she could see, or psychological damage, just sort of, he just wanted to improve his career, and she called him the embodiment, and this is her phrase, the banality of evil. The banality of evil. You know the word banal? Drearily commonplace, predictable, trite, banal. Just cliched. She said, that describes this guy. She said, it, it, and it's more horrifying. See, if, if the Nazi war criminals were manifestly psychopathic and utterly different from ordinary people, instead, he himself said he joined the SS not because he agreed or disagreed with its ethos, just because he needed to build a career, the utter banality of evil. That should rock us. That the most advanced sin makes us boring. But now, at the end of addiction, it's just, what is it? What do they say? You need more and more of that substance to achieve the same high. Why? The ultimate goal, Satan wants to take, see, sin starts out pleasurable at first and then leads to this dreary cycle, just banal, just over and over. Satan's ultimate goal is to remove even the little shred of pleasure. If he can get that and your soul, ultimately boring. C.S. Lewis quotes the mark, the mark of hell Ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration upon self. Instead of picturing hell as a, a state of all these fantastical demons and everything, no, a bureaucracy where everyone's perpetually concerned about their own dignity and advancement. Everybody's got a grievance. Everybody's got a bone to pick about how they were wrong. And everyone, li they were wronged. And everyone lives in the serious, deadly serious passions of envy, self-importance, and resentment. Advanced sin makes you boring. Your concerns are all about how you look, how you're doing. There's always a grievance. You never get out of yourself feeling sorry for yourself. In his introduction to Paradise Lost, C.S. Lewis calls it incessant autobiography. G.K. Chesterton has the best line, Satan fell through force of gravity, taking himself so seriously. The sleepless, unsmiling concentration upon himself, that's the primary thing. Don't get it twisted. There's no life in sin, no creativity. You hear these country music songs about, well, if I don't make it to heaven, all my friends will be in a bad place having a good time. No, you'll be in a bureaucracy of red tape for all eternity. Everyone focused on themselves further and further away from anything that remotely looks like community. That is the twisted perversion of God's plan of heaven. Ain't no rollicking good time, ceaseless concentration upon self, incessant autobiography. Oh, that's what sin does to us. That's what we find in Judges. And that, to me, that, that makes sense, right? When you have Adolf Eichmann, you have him in Judges 17 and 18. He's not really evil and creatively wicked, just sort of making less of God, reducing God, doing what's right in his own eyes. And that leads to all sorts of Judges 19 and worse. At least all sorts of stuff. I, I want to show you the, the, the nature of sin, and then we'll get to the hope at the end. <laughs> She's not, notice mom, when mom makes these household gods, very important, she's not worshiping other gods, at least she doesn't think so, she's not worshiping other gods. The, the, the images are of Yahweh. She's, she's worshiping not other gods, she's worshiping a reduced God, a God she's made in her own image. I wrote down some main points, just a couple for you to jot down if you want to follow the logic of this message. Main, main point number one, sin 
is an attempt to reduce God. And we do this in all sorts of ways. She's trying to whittle God down to a God you can manage, a God that you've tamed. That's the deal with making the, uh, 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 you know, the, the carved images. A lot of believers say, I get the first commandment not to have any other gods. But what's the big deal about making an image of God? Here's why. An image that you can make cannot possibly contain the full range of God's glory. And it is inevitably going to lead you to a God who has parts that you have picked and selected and rejected others. Does that make sense? The image of God that you want to worship is always going to be something different than the true God of the universe. We're all tempted to do this. And when you, that's the problem with making an image or even a, 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 a conceptualization of this God. It's a reduction. For example, and take the word of God, for example. What will happen is some people will magnify God's strength. That's all you hear about, but they obscure his compassion. See? For other people, all they want to talk about is celebrating God's grace but ignoring his justice, his truth, and his purity, right? It's like we all do that. We, we want to we sort of pick and choose, and what you end up with is a distortion of God. Not God as he is, but the God that, like, you want him to be, you know? I, you know, I don't want to, can you imagine? Oh, I don't want to pray thou who thou knowest thyself to be, Right? God, who you in your infinite wisdom, you who you alone know yourself and you will know me more than I know you right now, that you, the unknown creator of the universe, the God of holiness and justice. Now, I'd rather just pray to sweet little baby Jesus in a manger, right? I'd rather have my reduced version of God. Why? Well, when it comes to scripture, listen, there's stuff in here. I'll just be honest with you. There's stuff in here, quite frankly, I don't like. You know Why? Because this book stands in authority of me, I don't stand in authority of it. Which means I'm going to bump up against some things that the Word of God is going to judge in me. As we say, well, I, yeah, but I mean, really, isn't this an outdated sexual ethic? Come on, isn't, isn't, this, isn't, isn't this part a little outmoded? I mean, shouldn't we change this part? We can't. Why? I don't get to make the rules. If I do, it's wholesale rejection of who God is. But the attempt is always there to make a reduced version of God. We, we focus, uh, 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 we sort of filter what we want the Word to say, who we want God to be. J.D. Greer has a great illustration of, uh, of this. He says, imagine somebody comes up to you and says, uh, I, I've heard about your story, i heard about your life. I want to write a biography of you. And you are so flattered because you're not even dead yet, and you're already so fascinating. And, and yes, we're going to write about your story, and so they start talking, you sit down, you meet, and you've brought all this stuff and this material and pictures and your yearbook, and she says, yeah, that's great, we're going to use a lot of that, but also in my biography of you, you are a vegetarian. And you always vote independent, never, never Republican, never Democrat, always independent. And in my version of you, you are um, really terrible at human relationships, and so you live alone with 18 cats. Huh? And you would say, well, that, um, that's great. That sounds like a really interesting story. But you do realize if you publish this as a biography of me, I'm not a vegetarian. I, my... my my blood type is, is carnivore. Like, I'm, I, like, I'm not. I, I eat meat all the time. Those cats are looking good. You know, I, um, I, I don't vote independent. And my, I, don't, I have, like, a wife and a family. And I, I don't live alone with 18 cats. Like, so you're writing a biography, but you realize, if, yeah, 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 she says. But those points would be much more interesting. And those would be great. And you come to find out the person writing the story is a vegetarian and votes independent and, and, and uh, 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 has all these 18 cats. To which you say, well, wait a minute. When you say you're writing a biography of me, you realize what you're really doing is, is sort of writing a biography of, like, the me you want me to be. You're writing a biography of yourself. When you define God and morality as you prefer it to be, you're not submitting to God at all. You're really just worshiping a, 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 a deified version of you. God could not be clearer. God is not a God we could imagine. He's not a God that could be reduced to our specs. He can't be made in our image. He made us. And what's the outcome of a reduced God? Look, at, this is main point number two. 
So the temptation there, the graven image, mom reduces God, and then a reduced God can be bought. Look at verse 13. This captures man-made religion right now. Then Micah said, now I know, huh? Now I know. Anybody, you might not admit to it. Anybody ever play this game? Now I know the Lord will prosper me. Why? Because I have had stellar church attendance lately. Hmm? Now I know the Lord will prosper me. Why? You should see my Bible reading streak. I'm on day six. Okay. You should see. Now I know the Lord will prosper me. Why? I've got a Levite as a priest. I've checked all the boxes. This is man-made worship. I have been faithful to you, God, and, and not everybody has. I've been faithful to my family, and not everybody has, Lord. I, listen, I can name names if you need help, God, right? I have been tithing, and not everybody has. I've been faithful. I even signed up to fast, and I made it almost to 6 a.m., so I've done, I've done everything you, hey, hey, listen, God, in this relationship, isn't this how it works? I thought I signed up for this thing. So you explain to me why my kid is sick. You explain to me why I'm not walking under prosperous blessing. This is what man-made religion does, right? We're in an agreement here. I do my part to live a good life, and then you have to bless me. Like God is a, di is a divine vending machine, and our good deeds are figuring out which coins go in there so that we can press the blessings we want to receive. That's how pagan gods work. You bring the right sacrifice, Baal brings the rain. You fail to bring the right sacrifice, he brings the curses. It is very simple. And here, we, we don't have a divine vending machine. Here, we've got a relationship with a heavenly father. Well, that, now that's very different. But religion, in some ways, it's very simple. You live a good life, and God will bless you. And if he doesn't, you can sue him for breach of contract. But what do you do with Christianity? What do you do? He's, he's not your divine assistant. His goal is not your happiness. The goal of religion is, is not, to, not to design it in a way that works for you. It's to submit to it. God cannot be bought. Listen, the great substitute for true faith in God is this kind of religiosity that God exists for you, and if you do the right things, God owes you. But true faith says, God, you don't exist for me. I exist for you. Psalm 100 and Psalm 95, both. You, you are the shepherd and we are the sheep of your pasture. God, you don't owe me. This is something to think about. God, technically, you don't owe me anything, but I owe you everything. Religion asks, man-made religion asks questions like, how can I get God to help me in my business or my, my affairs or my health or my whatever? And when it doesn't happen, religion said, I gave you what I wanted, God. That was our deal. What happened? True faith says, God, what do you want to do in my life? And when you go through those hard times, you say, God, my only comfort in life and death is that I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm yours. So glorify me in the good times. Glorify me in the bad times. False religion seeks control of God. True faith surrenders to God. Religion seeks access to God to get him to do what you want. True faith gives God access to your heart so that he can tell you what he wants. Now, which God are you seeking this morning? Last one. When you shrink God down to a size you can control, here's the problem. You're always in danger of losing that God. Main point number three, a reduced God can be taken away and you'll be left with nothing. Look at Micah's comment in 1824. And Micah said, if you take the gods, now notice this, notice the irony of this. But if you take my gods <clears throat> that I made, <laughs> now anybody in our seat can look back at this and be like, bro, just say that back to yourself real quick. These are gods. They have power. I made them myself. <laughs> If you take these gods that I made, psst, just make more. They're worthless. <laughs> Not to him. If you take God that I made, by the way, only a man-made God can ever be taken from you. See? The true God of the universe, you have to submit to this God of the universe, but you get the promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you. A God you make can always be taken away. That's main point number three. Mike said, if you take the gods that I made, what have I left? What 
have I left? If you worry about losing God, th 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 this comes from this man-made religion. When you try to control God, when you reduce him, you live with anxiety. When you surrender to God, you live in peace. When you take your hands off your life, you say, honestly, God, my only comfort in life and death is that I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. So have you ever surrendered to God? Or are you still trying to manage and control him? Uh, again, I, I go to J.D. Greer and his teaching on this uh, topic. So good. He, he, he had a great example of uh, he was uh, in, in, waiting to board a plane there in the ticket agent, you know, the, 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 the waiting area. And uh, somebody finds out he's a preacher. And this has happened to me. And, oh, man, once somebody finds out you are a pastor, it's on. Like, they just want to tell you every experience with God, faith, religion, Christianity they've ever had. And you're like, yeah, this is that. I don't care. But anyway, I'm supposed to care. So I'm trying to, you know, you do this, right? And uh, uh, it just goes, and this lady, J.D. Greer tells it, this, this lady is next and says, oh, w w this is incredible. I sell, a I, I own a religious bookstore. And my religious bookstore is for every religion, every faith, right? And I sell all sorts of things. You wouldn't believe the stuff I sell. And she starts talking about some of the things. She sells little statues here. And, and, and she has some Hindu, you know, products. And she has some, some Buddhist products. And she says, oh, and for Christians, I have a huge line of products. She says, in fact, right, in fact, I've brought one of these along. And it's a bracelet with a little crucifix on it. And she said, it's designed for security and protection when, when we travel. Somebody overhears their conversation and says, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I've brought St. Christopher, who's the patron, pulls out a little, a little d d statuette of St. I brought St. Christopher because he's the patron saint of travelers. And as long as we've got St. Christopher, we're safe. And as this person saying says, and would you believe this? My horoscope says that I happen to be in this uh, zodiac sign that says today, if you're traveling, safety's guaranteed. And somebody says, well, we're certainly covered. And poor J.D. Greer, who's like, I know this is going to be a sermon illustration one day. I just don't know how, you know, like, what is happening, right? So as they're boarding the bridge, and he kind of, he tells it really funny. He says, you know, he was like, total witnessing fail. But as they're boarding the jetway, she says, listen, I know you're a, I know you're a, a you know, you said you're a Christian pastor, so I want you to have this. And she says, um, uh, if you'll put this in the palm of your hand, it's got a little crucifix, a little bracelet, it's got these beads. She says, if you'll put this in the palm of your hand when we take off, our safety will be guaranteed. And Pastor Greer looked at this woman, and I think with great compassion, he said, listen, I know we've only got a few minutes before we board, and, and hopefully we're not um, seated uh, together. But <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't say that. I said that. He didn't, he didn't say that. Um, he says, here's the deal. You, you, see this, you see this guy right here that's stretched out his arms on the cross? Uh, Christians believe that that is, uh, uh, that's, that rep we believe Jesus is God himself. And he came to this earth, born as a little baby, born in a manger, born in Bethlehem. And he grew up and lived a sinless life. And what he was doing, you see pictured right there, when he stretched out his arms and died on that cross, the wrath for sin was poured out on Jesus uh, by God. And Jesus offers his right standing with God to all who believe. But how do we know that that offering was acceptable? How do we know that once for all sacrifice was acceptable? I mean, you can write a big check. How do we know if it clears? Because on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And now he's ascended and he's high. He's got the name that is above every name. And that man right there, we believe, is the high and holy king of the universe. And so what guarantees our safety is not that I'm holding this little thing in the palm of my hand. What guarantees our safety is that, ma'am, he is holding us in the palm of his hand. Now that is a picture of man-made religion of Judges 17 through 21 versus the true faith of the gospel. Are we trying to manipulate and control God to get him to do what we want or are we trusting ourselves to the great God of the universe? Because I mean, otherwise, what do you do? Because if you create a God, it can be taken from you. What if you go to travel on an airplane and you realize St. Christopher is in another verse? <laughs> what are you gonna do? You're gonna lose your mind. And we can laugh at that but what if it's our idol? What if it's our idol? Hmm? What if it's our kids? We gotta love our kids. We gotta care for our kids. Yes, everybody hear me say that? Kids are awesome. They're a great gift from God. We gotta love them. What if they become an idol? And what if I did everything, God, and my only, my only request is that my kids turn out perfect? And what if they don't? Or what if they get really sick? 
Or what if some circumstance comes in their life? What do we do? We say, you can't take that. Why? Because if I lose that, what have I left? I've got nothing. Sometimes when I watch youth sports and I see people scream at the ref, sometimes I think they're having a bad day. But sometimes I wonder if something more is going on. Sometimes I wonder if that guy's screaming at the ref because he needs that call to go right. Why? Because you're messing with my idol, pal. If this doesn't go right, what have I left? I've put everything on this. And now we've got kids who are crushed under the weight of godhood that they were never meant to bear. What if it's our job? We're supposed to love our job. We're supposed to be great at our job. That's fine. We, we, we'll have a whole series on work. We're supposed to do excellent work. Everybody hear me say that? But what if our job becomes an idol? And if I were to lose my job, it's not just I'm going to be sad. Of course you're going to be sad. I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. Of course, that's fine. But what have I left? I had everything on that. If I haven't offended you yet, it's because I haven't picked your idol. I'll get to it. <laughs> I picked mine. I picked mine. You know, Jackie's all worried about the kids, and I'm like, trust God. And then I start worrying about the church. She's like, trust God. I'm like, it's easy when it's your idol. <laughs> you see? We've all got one. What if it's a relationship? What if it's money? Hey, you, you need to save money. You need to prepare for retirement. Okay, everybody hear me say, eh, fine, money. Yeah, 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 whatever. But what if, God, that stock market, go, stock market goes down. What, what have I left? It's no different than leaving St. Christopher in the other purse. Just a little more sophisticated. So what's the hope? Well, the hope is, uh, whew, I mean, sin makes us banal, trivial people because we whittle down God to an image of our making and we're left with just life without God is boring and banal and trite and cliche and secular. So the cure. The cure starts with the diagnosis of the disease and the real disease here obviously is, is we're talking about idols, first and second commandment. Now, go back, go back. God of all the, okay, you got all these pagan religions, and everywhere you go, you get to see your God. You get to touch him. You get to lay hands on it, and God denies Israel that right. Isn't that something? You go to the Philistine temple of Dagon, and when you go into the Holy of Holies there, there's Dagon. You can see him. You can offer your sacrifice. You know he's there. Tangible, a God. He'll tell you what to do. Just listen. No problem. You go to the Canaanite gods, and there's Baal, and there's Asheroth, a god, an image, something you can lay eyes on, tangible, prove it. Well, there's your proof. There it is. All good, right? You go into the Holy of Holies for Israel's tabernacle, and there, right between the cherubim, on the mercy seat, in the Holy of Holies, oh, right where the image of Yahweh should be, nothing. God denies his people the right to make an image. Why? Why? Don't we need, don't we need a God? We, I mean, I want to feel close to God, but why? Why would God deny us the right to make an image? What's the big deal about a graven image? Interesting. I think interesting. It's not because there'll never be an image. God does not deny you the right and me the right to make an image because there'll never be one. Quite the contrary. Listen, listen carefully. God denies us the right to make an image because whatever image we make will be a reduced version. We can't contain his glory. We can't contain his goodness. Whatever image we conceptualize will fall woefully short of God. And when we diminish God, we ultimately diminish ourselves. It's not, however, that we don't need an image. We do need an image, but we need an image not that you and I can make. The only image of God suitable for us is the image he himself will provide. You know where I'm going. A little baby born in a manger, born in Bethlehem, when Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, God in human flesh, what is Colossians 1.15? How does it describe him? Of all the words it could use, it says that Christ is what? He's the image of the invisible God. There's your image. And the reason the second commandment is for you and me not to make an image is not because we didn't need one. It's not because there would never be one. It's because an image that a human could make would be woefully inadequate. And the only image for God that he wants is the one he makes himself, the one he sends himself, the begotten son of God. 
a flesh and blood image. There he is, one with a body, one we will live with forever and ever, new heaven, new earth. You want to know what God is like? You look to Jesus Christ. I mean, the last verses, uh, there was no king in Israel, verse 25 of, of chapter 21. There's no king of Israel. Yeah, everybody did what was right in his own eyes. I mean, it's a disaster. And to me, the great miracle of Judges, and it's just my thinking, it's my takeaway, the biggest miracle in Judges is that there's a Ruth. Sorry, not in the book of Judges. I mean that, there's a, that, that you get another page of the Bible. Be honest. After Judges, wouldn't you think God would be like, oh, we're done here. <laughs> Instead, he starts over with Ruth. He starts with a kinsman redeemer. The only thing more stubborn than human sinfulness is the tenacity of the grace of God. The only thing more stubborn, the only thing that won't quit, seems like, more than human sinfulness is his, is his love for his people. And when he sent that image of God, when Jesus came, you know, the, the, those disturbing images, the unfaithful concubine was ripped apart. When Jesus comes, I mean, the guy sends his bride out to be ripped apart. When Jesus comes, he himself was ripped apart so that his bride could be saved. I mean, he's the ultimate unbroken Savior, the true judge who was to come. This Holy Week, I'm praying for eyes wide open and a heart wide open to be convicted over idolatry, how we've reduced you to, to, to those that are fasting this week. Let's continue to fast and humble ourselves before the Lord as we come to Good Friday this weekend. Let's join together as God's people on Easter Sunday and celebrate the great deliverance of the ultimate judge, the image of the invisible God, the true and unbroken Savior. And with that, we come to the end of Judges. Let's pray. God, thank you for your stubborn refusal to quit on your people. And thank you, Lord, that you, the unbroken Savior, acted on our behalf to save those of us sinful, rebellious, covenant breakers, caught in sin, leading to ever more banality, and yet you reached down and saved us. God, grant to us this week that our hearts would be open and our eyes would be open. We'd be convicted over idolatry. That you would allow us, instead of trying to control you, to rest in you and to be controlled by you, to open up our hearts and allow you to deal with us instead of us trying to manipulate you. Grant that to us, Lord. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Grant to us, do something special in our hearts, in our church, in our lives this holy week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.